So I'm Matt. Um, hopefully some of you saw me last year when I talked about just about Magda. Today we're going to talk, uh, sorry, about Terrier. Today we're also going to talk about Magda. Um, and how that relates to digital twins, what we have done, what we've learnt, um, and where we're going. So, first of all, I have to I have to talk about CSIRO. So, CSIRO is the uh, the national uh, science agency for Australia. Uh, data sixty one is the data and digital business unit in there. Um, we work in the Web Geospatial Systems Group, um, which is where we do geospatial stuff, open data, all this kind of good stuff. Um, I've worked in geospatial for quite a while now, and in the last year, these are the kind of challenges that comes up that people come and talk to me about. Uh, and most of the time they say, hey, Matt, you work in digital twins. Can, that, can digital twins solve these things for me? And I say, well, maybe. Um, we need to look at the data. Uh, but so let's talk about how this relates to digital twins and, and what we can do. So, um, so what is SimCity? Oh. Sorry, what is a digital twin? <laughs> <coughs> um, so one definition is from Gartner. It's a digital representation of a real-world object or system. Now, I quite like that. It's very simple to understand what that means. It means we get a digital thing, um, and it's, it's a copy of, you know, something. But a copy of my phone isn't really what we're trying to talk about here today, right? Um, for instance... This is a man using a HoloLens. Uh, he is handling a wor real world object, and the HoloLens is overlaying a digital twin on that object for him. And it's showing him things like internal structure, internal state, maybe how it's manufactured, something like that. Maybe it's putting other textures and things like that on there. Um, and so that's a digital twin of that object. Again, that's not what we're talking about. So there's a bunch of different types of twins. Um, you can make a digital twin of a machinery of government, so how government changes after an election. You can make twins of metallic additive manufacturing process, 3D printing, right? You make a twin of a 3D printed little part. Uh, systems engineering, if you want an aircraft, facilities management, now we're starting to talk about things, right? Now we've got a building, um, and that's kind of a little bit more about what we're talking about. So in order to define these things and figure out what it is that we're doing. We're working in a collaboration group, uh, the, nat um, the National Spatial Data Infrastructure Collaboration Group. Um, and so we're working with state government, we're working with Commonwealth government to figure out, uh, and ANSLIC, the Australian New Zealand uh, Land Information Council, um, trying to figure out exactly what is the digital twin and, and like how do we make one? What does it mean to, to be a digital twin? So ANSLIC and the people in the collaboration group have put together a number of draft terms. And so at the top, we're talking about a digital representation on the scale of precincts to regions. Then we go a spatially enabled digital twin. And now we're starting to exclude all these other digital twins, right? Um, and then the vision at the bottom is a national digital twin ecosystem where we have a bunch of different digital twins. They all talk to each other. They all work together in some shape and form. Along with that comes a maturity model. We're somewhere between two and three. We've got a bunch of data. We're trying to enrich it with real-time data. Um, and so th there's a lot of talk about a digital twin has to have a pulse, meaning we have to get the real-time state of the world into it. So, and the reason we have to work with all these uh, collaborators is that um, what's below the surface of Digital Twin is important, right? So we have to figure out what the data infrastructure should look like, what the services, standards, governance of these data sets and, and um, Digital Twins should be, right? Um, and so that's why we have to work with a lot of people, because we can build something, and we, we love building stuff, but if it doesn't actually mean that other people can use it in their, in their Digital Twins, um, it's kind of pointless, right? So we come up with things like fancy diagrams with puzzle pieces showing how digital twins can work together, right? Um, so that we can operate with other digital twins, like the Fisherman's Bend digital, Fisherman's Bend digital twin, um, which is not based on Terrier and Magda. But we want to be able to interoperate with them. They should be able to use our services. We should be able to use their services. 
<coughs> and so we have built, uh, this was quite a while back now, uh, we built a proof of concept with New South Wales. Um, this comes on the back of the state infrastructure strategy uh, and on the Western Sydney city deal. And so we have, using Terrier, using Magda, built a proof of concept uh, in a couple of, well, eight weeks. Um, and so we stuck what data we could find um, so that we could show it to them. And now we're working on a much more, um, on a larger uh, digital twin. So the tech that we put in it is Terrier on the left uh, and Magda on the right. So we've got Terrier that we built for the Australian national map. Uh, we've got Magda that we built for data.gov.au. Um, and we stick them together. So Terria, we have a lot of platforms now using Terria. So the national map, um, the investor map, the national environmental information infrastructure, um, Arimi, the renewables map, um, the national drought map, and now Digital Earth Africa, um, and going on to um, the Pacific map that we're doing together with the SPC. For Magda, we started data.gov.au. Um, we're now doing agency Magda, meaning two different departments that we're starting with, being able to securely share data between themselves. Um, and that then goes on to federated Magda, where we're con connecting all these departments um, to data.gov.au so that we can share across data.gov.au to other departments. And so these are the two building blocks for our digital twin, right? The reason they work so well together is because they share a, a lot of founding design principles, that they should be federated, accessible, open, accommodating, time aware, and in Terrier's case, 3D, right? The world isn't flat. Um, and so that's, these are the kind of things that we believe goes into a digital twin um, and has to be properties of digital twins. <coughs> so here's what we built. Um, this is still the proof of concept, and so sometime early next year, we will do a launch of a larger New South Wales digital twin, which will have more features and more data and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but this is what we're showing at the moment. Um, so it started out, the proof of concept started out just being for Penrith, which is that LGA there on the western uh, side of Sydney. Uh, and now it's being ex expanded to the whole Western Sydney city deal, which is eight LGAs and covers something like 10% of the population of New South Wales. Um, when we started out, uh, we got um, strata data, which is the legal volumes of space um, that you have if you own a property. And we then went on and we started getting subsurface utilities, pipes, things like that. And we started uh, experimenting with how we can show things underneath the ground and remove, um, uh, remove the ground. And then we started making it interactive so that you can play around and you can show different parts of the 3D volumes of space, right? Because uh, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see and visualize the inside of that building if you couldn't actually remove parts of it. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about BIMs, building information models. So effectively CAD models, hopefully, of buildings. Um, and the reasons you saw in those challenges, there's a lot of building uh, challenges that they have. They want to see where's the asbestos, where's the flammable cladding, all this kind of stuff, right? And so if you can actually get a, a CAD model that has the attributes of the, build, of the components of the building, um, then you can start to interrogate it and ask it, what, what, um, show me all the pipes that has asbestos, show me all the flammable cladding. And once we have that over larger areas, um, then you can do searches on that. <clears throat> we put in a bunch of uh, 3D buildings, uh, again, just using the data that we um, are given, right? So this is, in this case, this is PSMA data, for those of you who know um, Australia, um, together with LiDAR scans, so you can augment it with roof lines. Um, and so at the moment, in this demo, there's 130,000 buildings. In the new version for the eight LGAs, there's something like half a million buildings. Um, so that you can start to uh, investigate that. Uh, and then we go on to photo meshes. The screen might not really show it, but this is a large 3D model of a town in New South Wales. And here we're showing how you can 
basically zoom out to see the whole world, or you can zoom in and see sub-centimeter resolution imagery where you have it. And so we have a composite model that has many different resolutions of imagery. Um, this is a large uh, Brisbane high resolution photo mesh, so down to two and a half centimeters, so two centimeter resolution, I think. Uh, and so here you can see things like the collection of um, the data collection time because of the clock. You can zoom into air conditioner units and you can see the, the brand on the air conditioner unit on the top of the buildings, things like that. Um, and so it's when you connect this kind of data um, together with more real time live data. So the little blue blobs here, um, they are buses. And so in Sydney, we can, and in Brisbane now, we can show the real time buses. We show the buses moving around. Um, it says where they are, how, um, what the uh, number of people on the bus are, if there are many seats available or if it's full or whatever, uh, how fast it's moving and so on. <coughs> and so this is an example, and that's why I was saying in the maturity model, we're between two and three, because we're just starting to connect these IoT, these sensor data streams, right? Um, this is really, this is where the pulse comes in. This is how we get the current state of the world. Um, and uh, over time, we'll also get the historical state of the world. <clears throat> Some of the, or a lot of rather, a lot of the FSDF, the foundational spatial data sets, um, that's really kind of the base of all of the data that goes into digital twins. So in this case, this is the cadaster, the, the land, the property boundaries, right, um, over time. So on the left, it's 2011, uh, which is the gray part, and that shows before the subdivision. Uh, and then in the pieces in the middle there is where the subdivisions happened, and we get a lot more blue parcels, which are up-to-date parcels. And so trying uh, or showing this, showing the 2D data over time together with the 3D data of the strata, uh, and so this can be cadaster or imagery or satellite or you know, whatever, showing these different types of data together with IoT, for instance, now we're starting to talk about, okay, now we are approaching a digital twin, um, which is, in our opinion, still many, many years in the future, um, but it's kind of showing the promise of what it could do. <coughs> um, and of course, it has to be responsive. So this is me playing around last night in my phone, uh, and I just recorded that to show that you should be able to access it. It should be accessible, right? You should be able to access it on your phone um, wherever you are. So I should be able to stand on the street, hold up my phone, and I should see the things that are in front of me, and I should see the digital state of those, right? Then, then we're starting to talk digital twin. <coughs> so that was New South Wales. We have now also started uh, working with Queensland um, for their uh, southeast Queensland city deal, um, and so this is just kind of a screenshot of, we have buildings at the moment that we've categorized. We have a bunch of other data, basically. Uh, and so Queensland is going to be another of our digital twins and leading on to a, a potential future national digital twin, right, of interoperating digital twins, uh, a, a true kind of ecosystem. So what else have we learned? Um, well, 3D data is really hard. Um, we're not supposed to be mapping things in space. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Uh, 2D data is fairly simple, it's well understood now. It's fairly easy, you understand, you just kind of drape things over the ground, right? But 3D data is really, like, really hard. Um, it, it's really hard to make sense of it, and it comes in different formats. So there's a, there's a huge maturity thing that has to happen here for uh, standardization of formats, right? <clears throat> We also learned it takes an ecosystem, right? And so we are building all this stuff. We're using open source, open standards. We're building all this stuff and standing on everybody else's shoulders, right? As well as contributing back to that ecosystem. Um, so there's no way that we could have done this, you know, everything you've seen, all the 3D stuff that you've seen today, that's cesium, right? Cesium is a thing that's existed for a long time. We are heavily, heavily leveraging cesium. Um, we're using a bunch of libraries. We're writing new libraries and con contributing them back. Them back. Um, and there's an ecosystem of data as well. And so we realized there is Wellington 3D data on Monday. And so we went, oh, let's just stick it in the twin and see you know, what we can do with it. And so there's an ecosystem of 
of everything, right? And, and we are a little piece of it. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that everything is open so that we can, we can all share and interoperate, right? Um, that's pretty much it, I think. Um, so we have a trade table. Come and talk to us and see, like, we can do an actual live demo, which I, I didn't trust the network to do here. But do come and, and talk to us, and we can do that. Um, and also, we're about to start hiring again. So if this is one of you, come and talk to me. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Have we got any questions for Matt? Great, great talk. I found it quite, quite fascinating. Um, I'm a, I'm a, ge a, ge a, ge a ge 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 geologist. I was just wondering, what plans do you have for mod 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 modelling all the mining activity that's happened in in New 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 New, New South Wales and Queensland, particularly all the un 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 the underground developments. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I want I want to model all of it. Right, um, funding is an issue for modeling everything, for, for mapping everything. Uh, we have a couple of projects that are starting to go ahead now about mapping individual mines and, and seeing change over time, things like that. And so certainly that's something that we want. We already have a bunch of uh, ge geology layers, uh, rocks and dirt layers, right, um, that we get from our friends at Geoscience Australia, for instance. Um, and other places, state governments and things like that, that shows the mines and shows what they're trying to do or the planning applications, things like that, right? Uh, but it's all, yeah, there are pieces that we do want to show. We don't want it just to be cities. We want it to be states and eventually national. I mean, one day, international, right? Any more questions? Ah. Uh, in, in the 3D modeling, uh, when you're talking about doing the BIM modeling, um, the biggest problem that I've had in the past is getting the uptake of getting engineers or architects to give up their models in the first place. Have you found the same problem, or can you get that information more readily these days? Or? Um, the, so there is a multifaceted problem. One of them is often that the engineering uh, organizations and the, the contracts that the people funding the construction have often not written in who the IP should go to. And so um, as far as the engineering consultancy is concerned, it's their IP. They're not going to give up that easily, and then you're going to have to pay extra for that. Even if they do give it up, it's not public data. It's their IP again, and you can't show it publicly. And so there's a lot of um, education that has to happen um, with state governments, with local government, with commonwealth government, to make them understand that you need to think about data these days. Even if you're building something, right, you're building a physical thing, you need to think about the data that comes with that thing um, so that you can represent it in whatever, whatever form it is, right? Whether that's a digital twin or just a facilities management thing, um, and what you can do with that data in the future. Um, secondly, BIM is still pretty raw. Um, there's a lot of standards, and it's uh, it's not really ready for prime time. And so that's we're doing our little part to try and make that a thing. Uh, we can always do better. We we could do a lot better than we're doing at the moment. Um, and I, I that's just something that's going to come over years, right? Over experience. Greg, I have a question. I work for a major engineering firm. I'm so with you. Um, I've worked on stuff across states, really large projects, and um, I never get a request for my data to be ready to go into something like that. I think that needs to happen. I think it needs, you know, I think it needs to happen um, from the request from the state government or the subconsultant to the engineering firm. I mean, I know the designers really stick to particular standards and they are really working on um, bringing in that 3D side of things as well. Um, and with what Aerometrics is doing and working with them as well. Um, I really think this is, um, this is possibly, you know, a, a way to get in and start getting that standards happening. It needs to be, like, ready to go into something like this. If, um, I don't know, somehow that could happen, that would be great. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree, right? And so we work with a lot of Aerometrics data. A lot of the data you saw here today was Aerometrics data. Um, but usually the state government or whoever the, the stakeholder is, is between us and the people supplying the data. And so it's very hard for us to uh, work with them and agree on, okay, this is the format that we need. Do you produce it? If not, how do we make that? Um, and so there's a real kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know. We have to get better at doing that and like asking, we need to talk to the people actually doing the producing this. And it helps the stakeholders too to get the data in the right format for the future because we might actually know, have better ideas about how to do that. There's, um, there's also a lot of um, messing around in engineering firms on what is BIM, what is Digital Twin and people trying yep. to do it themselves. I yep. think they really, yeah, need this. <laughs> Thanks. So one question, you said that you federate your data. Yes. Does that mean you actually hold the data or do you rely on other people to provide it online to you? That's right. So, so it means we don't hold the data. Right. So, so what agreements do you have in place to keep and sustain that? Because that's really what's going to take you through that maturity model. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, there's a lot of experimentation going on, which is great. But when you actually need to sustain that, you've actually got to make sure that all those agreements are in place, repeatable, updatable, and all of those sort of things. So how are you addressing that? Um, absolutely. Uh, and it comes with a host of other issues like reliability and, and look and feel and all this kind of stuff, right? Like huge area of issues that we have to learn how to deal with. Um, so in the past, we have signed individual contracts or, or agreements rather, not contracts, agreements with the people, the data custodian on that data to say, okay, how long will you make it available? What's the update cycle? All this kind of stuff, right? What's your SLA for that data? Um, yes, we don't hold the data. And so if we have a thousand layers on a digital twin, any given day, five or 10 of them are not gonna work. Um, there's not really much you can do to avoid that apart from working with those data custodians that have issues and try and help them um, get better at what they do and, and make sure that they provide the funding um, to, to keep it up to date and keep it working. So, but having it visible in a public platform or in a platform, whether or if it's public or not, right, is one way for them to see who is using this data, why are they using it for, what is my business case, for spending money on keeping these services alive, right? And so instead of before where they had to make their own map, put it on their website, and then also maintain those data services, now those pieces fit into other things. And so there's an efficiency there. They don't have to make their own map anymore unless they want to, a lot of them want to. Um, but it, it, they can really kind of understand why they should be doing it. But yeah, it's, it's tricky, it's spaghetti, right? Okay. You talked about, you know, having the public open data and whatnot, but sometimes the problem isn't quite that simple. Um, have, have, has there been any work done on, you know, some sort of federated authorization system so you can tie and say, yes, this bit's public, but some of it's not, but some users can have it? Um, have you looked at yep. how that might work? Yeah, that's central to what we're doing. So that's where the whole... Uh, data.gov.au at the moment is public data, open data. Um, agency Magda is authorized data, and so authorized sharing between authenticated users. Um, when we get into federated Magda, that's where we want to have a much larger system, which is open public data and uh, authorized shared data, right? So that somebody in New South Wales can, via data.gov.au, share with particular person in Queensland and only they can see it, right? Depending on what level in government you are, maybe you have different visibility of certain data sets across different departments, things like that. Um, yes, we, we have a system at the moment um, that works like that. Once you authenticate, so our digital twin, you go to our digital twin, you log in as somebody in New South Wales, you get to see more New South Wales data sets in addition to the open data sets. If you log in as Queensland, you get to see the Queensland in addition to the open data sets on one system, yeah. Can private data suppliers authorise other private data consumers 
that's where Access we want to get to, to. Yeah. yeah. That's the vision, right? That anybody, I should be able to log in with a Gmail address and say, I have this data set, I want that to be part of this digital twin ecosystem, and I want to charge 100 bucks for everyone who uses it, and they have to put the credit card in. That's the marketplace that we want to enable on top of this ecosystem, right? Absolutely.